Well, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce our two speakers from overseas that help us remind to, to really come and let us know about people and colleagues who are doing this kind of work and ministry in other places. We, I think we in, in the United States in these days too often, our vision doesn't go far beyond our shores. And uh, I think that's a real shame and because we really need to work along because there's a lot of stuff going on through faith groups in other places. In fact, I have friends and contacts with any number of groups in Africa and people who've done, tried to do work in Africa around supporting people with disabilities and their families. And they say, the, really the only pathway to use is to work through faith communities because there's not the public infrastructure to help provide those supports in, in many places and that working through faith communities has been the way to not only provide basic services and supports but also to change and build awareness. So we have two speakers today. Um, Christopher, did you and Bishop talk about who was gonna come first? Does it make any difference? Okay. Uh, Christopher Rajkumar, I met online, uh, I know at least last year, but maybe earlier than that. He worked, I'm not gonna read all of his res, uh, bio, you can read it at the Dropbox site and on the website. But he, last year he co contacted me and said, can we know some information about your summer institute and how it's structured and what it, what it, uh, what it does? Because in November in India last year, they were doing something very similar. Uh, putting together a kind of first attempt there to bring together theologians and others who were interested in theology and disability in India. He's been the coordinator for a national uh, disability project through the Council of Churches in India. Comes from South India himself. I tried to think about going but to, to, that, to that conference, but it was a little bit too late and too uh, right on top of something else. Uh, but I was f fascinated with it. And then there are, there are other groups in India who've also been working together with around a couple of national conferences. And there's been a, a couple of books that have come out of India, people writing about theology and disability. So it's with great pleasure uh, that I introduce Christopher, my new friend Christopher, and to hear, come to talk with us about what's happening in India. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Bill, for your kind words. Uh, correct. Uh, thank you. Uh, as uh, uh, Bill said, the last summer institute I was trying to come but could not make it. But we wanted Bill to be there with us in our, some, our institute. Uh, Bill also could not join. But now uh, we both are here. Thank you so much for facilitating this wonderful opportunity. Indian Disability Ecumenical Accompaniment is a program or an ecumenical initiative of the National Council of Churches in India. Uh, till March, I was officially associated as a director, but now I'm volunteering with this organization, uh, having the continuous uh, uh, continuity of this particular program. 2009, we have started working on disability concerns, initiated several disability conversations at different levels, theologically, ministerially, diaconally, socially, and academically, and so on. In this 10 years, whatever is the learning that we gained, I just would like to share with you. These learnings are absolutely kind of a personal as well as an organizational learning. Hope we all would be collectively benefited out of it. In 
Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Fantastic. Uh, in 2009, the church where I have come from, the Church of South India, the diocese, in our diocese, we have had about uh, 12 disability programs. In 2009, uh, sorry, 2000, sorry, 2000, our diocese has initiated a home for the intellectually challenged children. So we have invited the social welfare minister to inaugurate uh, that particular program. The Humpty number of clergies and our bishop, church members, everybody have assembled in that function where the minister was supposed to inaugurate. So the clergy or leaders, while they were started, you know, uh, uh, fe uh, felicitating the bishop and the initiative, they have requested bishop to initiate similar programs you know, everywhere. Opening up a home for the intellectually challenged or the mobility challenged and so on. The minister's time came. The minister belongs to a secular party. He was not a Christian. He started his speech saying, dear religious leaders, Please pray to your God not to create such disabled human beings. He further said, I don't wish to open any more homes like this. This would be my last with a great sadness and heavy heart, I open this, but hereafter, I will not open such homes exclusively for the people with the disabilities. I was one among the clerics. This statement theologically touched my heart. There was an another incident where I was ministering in a parish. Normally we invite guest speakers. There was a guest speaker. We have had a couple of families and the families started regularly coming to the church with their intellectually challenged children. We all know when the service is on or when people are singing or happy, the children also started, you know, singing in their own language, uh, uh, in their own way. While the preaching was on, one child started raising its own voice as well as started singing actually. The preacher got an eye and said, Oh, insensitive parents, I command you to take your children away. Sadly, the parents left. Then I had to go and wish for it. But the time was too short. The things had happened. After that, we had a long conversation. That's a different issue. Who is insensitive here? Is the clergy or the parents, the people who are in the pew? The congregation accepted these families. All, we all were part of you know, the entire congregation. So who is insensitive? This was an, another ministerial challenge that I got in my ministerial journey.
As we all know, the church is a professional caregiver. From the Francis of Assisi's time or even beyond that, the church started serving the uh, disabled people due to war and so on. Church is a professional caregiver, giving health and medical care to the war victims and so on. It has got a long ministerial experience in the field of carrying the people with the disabilities. Nobody can deny. Having such ministerial culture and traditions, we as church, church often, you know, we think that we are the custodians of the underprivileged. Without us, nothing. So what happens is, uh, the, 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 the philanthropic or the charity mode has assumed our missional approach. I'm not saying that has to be stopped, but how much love is being extended beyond the currencies? is to be viewed. One side we confess and affirm that the entire human community is created in God's image. And yet, on the other side, we traditionally, no, not this group, we, but the general Christian communities, we traditionally believe that the disability is a curse or punishment from God. But they Iran is that we serve them with Christian commitment, with a liberative spirit. These were, you know, three areas with church in India, interrogating ourselves, or evaluating ourselves to look at it. We may be professional in handling the disability programs or caregiving programs, Probably it could be a charity, but how much we consider people with disabilities as people who are created by God in God's image. With this backdrop, we had a similar institute as Bill has just referred, where we have gained some kind of a theological as well as missiological insights. This institute suggests a few theological and missiological shifts. Uh, this document is available on the website. Probably we could very well refer it, and few copies I have. If you wish, you could have it uh, for your reading. And the book which is available also carries uh, these concerns in, there, uh, in, in its document. The first shift is great commission to great commandment. When the mission talks about outreach, reaching out the vulnerable and the people who live in the edges of the society with a great commission, this, this is a general uh, idea the church has got to reach out. But the concern before us when we take up the specialized ministries, in an unquote specialized ministries, ministering with people with disabilities, great com commandment. Love your neighbor. This shift will facilitate our missional approach in, in addressing the disability conversations and discourse by facilitating us to do gospel rather preaching gospel. Doing gospel is the mission and ministerial challenge today. The second shift that is proposed is conventional to covenantal. Conventionally, lethargically, regularly, we involve in several uh, ministry, or we adopt several ministerial approaches in addressing or working on the disability concerns. But the covenantal is transformational. 
creative, liberative. How much these components have got into our missional approach when we take up the uh, 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 ministry, uh, uh, the ministry towards people with disabilities. The third shift that could be considered is witness and respect. It could be a kind of an obvious physical uh, uh, disabled person that we could see physically. But the other side, other side, how much the person with disability is respected matters a lot. Most of the cases in our context, the symbolic inclusion that takes place because of some of the policies, government policies and so on, yes, we do have some space. There is a ramp. You walk in. It's a tokenism was, you know, being adapted by we say, yeah, 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 they are also part of us. They, okay, they are also part of us. But how much respect is given? Respect is a gospel call indeed. The next shift which is proposed or suggested to, to have a religious ethics and missional goals. As we all know, in yesterday's, you know, one of the discussions we were discussing about it, the religious ethics always, or mostly, I should not say always, mostly discriminates people. Either deuteronomic, you just let us think about deuteronomic expressions. Even if it is a small scar, that will not be accepted by the religion. But the missional goal, according to John 10.10, 10, life and fullness. Whether you, you, you are a person with a disability or any other person, but the missional call here is nothing but life in fullness, by which we've been discussing about belonging. So the, the missional goal facilitates the entire congregation to belong to each other. The other shift is transparency and integrity. How much our missional approach in terms of addressing the disability issues transparent? I mean, the whole thing I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sharing from the Indian context, Indian church's point of view, our own experience. It might not fit in some of our contexts, but still, the transparency and integrity in our approach need to be evaluated in the light of the gospel call, gospel that affirms justice, peace, and love. The other shift, solidarity, from solidarity to accompaniment. Sending solidarity message for the ecumenical councils like us, it's very simple. We just type few lines. It's here we express our solidarity with the vulnerable communities. But how much our ministry accompanies the people with the disabilities? Is the church cry with them? Joys with them? Walk with them? Accompaniment. It is not just merely expressing our solidarity. It is beyond. Finally, charity to justice and right affirming. Is our gospel work, is our missional work affirms the right of the persons with the disabilities, not the societal human rights, but the right to worship right to participate in the very life and mission of the church, 
right affirming approach. The next phase which I would like to share with you is some of our challenges what we have in our Indian context in terms of doing disability theology. The global theological fraternity has, you know, created a standard to articulate any theology. But in our experience, we found it a bit difficult to meet those standards. Because doing disability theology has to have a kind of an experiential one. We call, we, 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 I mean, the storytelling is a common term that we use. Are we, are, we, are we documenting the faith stories to articulate our theologies? Dr. Casey Abraham, a renowned theologian who recently passed away, who uh, lived with a child with uh, intellectually challenged, he describes or he uh, facilitates the theological fraternity to consider three groups to articulate uh, disability theology. One is the people with disability themselves. Number two, the family members are the siblings of the people with the disabilities. The third one is the caregivers, whether we could be part of an organization, but whoever it may be, we have, have to have kind of a close association in terms of relating ourselves with PWDs. How about our theological articulations today in terms of articulating disability theologies? Are we trying to meet the academic standards and the norms of the global theological fraternity? Or to bring out the real faith experience of the people? Theology is nothing but one's own reflection on God in a particular context. If we accept that definition. Where about or how about the standards? So the three uh, sub-themes that it is suggested. One is documenting faith stories. It's like a gospel narrations. We cannot canonize in, 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 along with the gospel. But would there be a possibility for us to document those faith stories? either from the people with the disabilities, or the siblings, or the caregivers, or the people who are associated with people with the disabilities. In the book, you could find three uh, uh, stories, actually. Very powerful, inspiring stories. It, it speaks to you like anything. Very powerful, documenting. Then the other one is reading the scriptures from the eyes and the experiences of the PWDs. Not as an abled person who read Bible or the scripture, you know, for the people with the disabilities. From the eyes and experiences of the PWDs. And third, publish them for the benefits, for the benefits of all to use as a source in terms of articulating theologies. The other concern which we found in, in, in India, Indian context, is disabled friendly theological education. We have developed, a, we got a university where the Protestant and Orthodox churches uh, have got 58 seminaries under this university, affiliated to this university. So we have developed a curriculum on disability theology. Unfortunately, we do not have enough staff to teach this theology. So there won't be motivation for the students to take up this course. And there is a norm in the university that minimum eight students we should have to offer this course. But even if the eight, eight students come, we don't have a faculty. Even the, in, in, in the you know, documents, resources, those are not disabled friendly. And most of the seminaries, our seminaries are very good old seminaries, and the accessibility is a challenge. And the people with the disability, though they are interested, even some of the church rules, they don't allow them to pursue the theological education. Even if they pass out, they might not get ordained in the church. Probably some ministry may be given, 
is a teaching ministry or something, but they cannot minister as a pastor in the church. It's some of the rules. So, disabled friendly theological education is a big challenge for us now. We are, we are working towards this and we are, uh, we are, we are working on, uh, motivating on that. Accessible and inclusive church is an another important area that we are working on. Uh, you know, there's a common say that church without PW is a disabled church. It's a very common and everywhere we tell. Unfortunately, uh, any of our churches or most of our churches are not really accessible in terms of welcoming the people with disabilities. I just would like to uh, uh, inform a statement which was made by an 11 years old child. She said in the school, we don't want your wheelchairs. We don't want your wheelchairs. We want a space in the church. That is the reality. We have beautiful pianos, decorated altars, accessibility is a big challenge. So we started negotiating or talking or con conversing with our churches to, to work on uh, accessible church, the physical accessibility and transparent inclusion. Only one illustration that I would like to share on this particular thing. In 2016, we had our quaternal assembly, assembly where 600 church leaders, the top level church leaders from India have assembled. One of the morning worships were given to the people with the disabilities, I mean, the program which we belong, Indian Disability Ecumenical Accompaniment. So the people with the disability have come to, uh, to, to, to organize that particular worship. Everybody assembled, all the bishops, metropolitans, suffragans, and so on, everybody were there. People came on wheelchairs and other, you know, with other assistances, but could not have an access to the altar. Finally, what happened? They have chosen a center table, the pew itself. The worship was conducted from the pew. That altar was not a dedicated altar, but the worship was held from the pew. A table from the pew have made as an altar. That challenged several church leaders. Even their evaluations and their sharings, they said, we need to work on it. So some kind of a, 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 a you know, awareness initiatives we take through such activities. But this happened just like that. But we purposefully do some kind of a skit and such things on those things. Ministered by and ministered with. Normally ministered to is a common term for the Christians, Christian churches. Ministering to the people with the disabilities. But the challenge before us today, are we ready to be ministered by the PWDs and with PWDs is the biggest challenge. There are a few theological glimpses that I would like to share it with you before I conclude. In the, work, in the, in the institute which we, we had a couple of months back, one of the pastors said, at the time of second coming, when Jesus comes, we all will be raised. But let us not put our theological you know, knowledge into this and to uh, question about whether Jesus will come or not. L let us take up this conversation as it is. When Jesus comes, we all will be raised. So the question was whether I will be raised as a normal person or person with, with a disability. Many said, no, no, you will be normal, don't worry. You will not have suffering there in heaven. But a pastor said, I want to remain as a person with a disability even in heaven. What could be the theological response? 
from the academic or academicians. The other very interesting conversation is that the person who has a kind of a, a you know, speech challenge, she said, I hope in heaven the people will know or are having the sign language. So the entire heaven will have a sign language. But I'm told in Indonesia there is a village where the entire village speak to each other in sign language because most of the children are the people who cannot speak. It's a heavenly experience, isn't it? The third very important thing which according to me is Emmanuel. The resurrected Emmanuel is a disabled Emmanuel who limps along with me, said, in another, said by another participant. The resurrected Emmanuel is limping Emmanuel who limps and walks with me. Another pastor said, I was asked to be on bed forever, but the congregation, they prayed for me. Now I'm able to get down as well as walk with crutches. For me, it's my resurrection experience. Another girl, young girl, she said, she, she was not belonging to, still, I don't think, she belongs to a Christian faith, in an unquote. But the pastor in the church was very committedly praying for the healing of this girl. When she has come to know that the unknown people are praying, she realized Christ is good. And she started attending the church now by saying that I accept my disability. But unknown people are praying for me. Friends, these are some of the ministerial experiences that we have had in our Indian context. Can church be the church of all and church for all? If not the church, then who? If not now, then when? Let inclusivity be the mission mandate of the church. God bless us all. Thank you. <laughs>many of you know that I've spent most of my life working at a, what's called a University Centers of Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. You said, Sarah's call there. You have a you said in every state, at least one in the United States. And one of the you said's, one of the ones that does a whole lot on community inclusion um, and, and has got great resources that can be used in religious as well as secular settings, especially their little newsletter called Impact which takes a theme and develops a number of stories from experiential and from theoretical positions. Uh, uh, it's the University of Minnesota. And a good friend of mine, if I've grown up in the American Association of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, grown up with me, kind of, Amy Hewitt, uh, became the director of that institution, of the USED in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And she then began to tell me about they had been asked to come to Zambia and to work with some people in Zambia. Uh, and then she told to me that we, trying to figure this out, realized that the only way we could do anything that would get to families really was to work through congregations and faith communities. And a few years ago, she brought with her Bishop Patrick Chisanga to an American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities meeting uh, where I met him and a colleague of his and uh, 
have followed through Amy, some of the work that they've continued to do. And she, earlier this year, said to me, Bill Patrick Bishop Kasanga would like to perhaps come to the Summer Institute, and we'd be glad to help get him there. Uh, would there be an opportunity for him to not only be part of the Institute, but to share? And so that's how I now get to welcome Bishop Patrick Chisanga, uh, a Catholic bishop from uh, Zambia. Thank you, Bill, for the kind words, and um, thank you to you and your team for making it possible for me to be here and have this wonderful, wonderful experience. I come among you as one who is willing to learn, learning also by sharing my own experience, the experience of my specific context. Yesterday in the morning, we learned about uh, located art. So um, my sharing would be based on the Diocese of Mansa, over which I preside, and the context also of my country, uh, Zambia. Um, okay, let me figure out how this works. Okay, so basically, I. Uh, speak about uh, my context and um, I uh, speak about the certain cultural perspectives uh, regarding uh, people with disabilities and the efforts towards inclusion, uh, the theological motivations, pastoral actions and fruits and then we uh, conclude. Um, so our inspiration is drawn from Jesus the Good Shepherd who come among us, who has come among us that we may have life and have it in abundance. Every Catholic bishop appoint, appointment, I learned these things five years ago when I was appointed a bishop, that uh, chooses a theme or a pastoral guidance or a motto. So I got the inspiration to pick John 10.10 10 as my pastoral motto that they may have life and have it in abundance. So from the very beginning of my ministry uh, in Mansa Diocese, we in our strategic plan would want to have a diocese, a community that embraces everyone with the love of Christ. And we know that this love of Christ does not leave out anyone. It includes every person including people with different abilities. Located at, Zambia is that small dot in the world. So I came all the way from there to where we are, across the Atlantic Ocean. It's just uh, our location. And you'd realize just a located at, uh, Zambia is land-linked, not landlocked. We don't have access to the sea but we are uh, surrounded by different countries, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Tanzania, Malawi, the Eastern border, and Mozambique, my good neighbor from uh, uh, Zimbabwe, the South, uh, Namibia, Botswana, and Angola. So we have neighbors who are also our good friends. Um, just briefly, Zambia is a former British colony. That's why English is our official language. We got independence in 1964. Zambia has up to 72 ethnic groups or tribes. Um, so there are so many different languages. The seven are the main different languages that are spoken. But in public communication, we use English. The first president, uh, kept the motto that has united our country up to now, the one Zambia, one nation. Our country has uh, always depended on copper. It is one of the major producers of copper in Africa. 
uh, but uh, you know the market forces the giants some can some uh, sometimes suffocate these markets so there are efforts deliberate efforts to de uh, diversify um, with a population of um, only about 17 million and mostly young young uh, would be maybe 20 years and below they generally flat and many natural resources including the mighty Victoria Falls uh, we, with which we share the border with Mozambique, one of the seven wonders of the world. M located at Mansa Diocese, we have 11 dioceses in Zambia. The diocese is um, about 19,000 square miles with a population of just over one million people, a third of whom are Catholics, over whom I preside as a bishop. Um, located at, um, uh, economically, the region is one of the poorest and has always depended on uh, fish farming, uh, looking at the major lakes in the north and uh, the southeast and uh, many rivers, uh, no industries and so forth. So really, uh, economically, uh, the region of Mansa Diocese is, is quite, uh, quite poor. Uh, that is the cathedral uh, um, from where I, I, um, I administer the people of God. We have uh, we are divided into 27 parishes. We are running three mission hospitals and a number of uh, education centers. One of them is is called Saint Mary's School for children with visual impairment and albinism. Actually, this St. Mary's School, um, those are the beautiful children of our school, um, mostly children from our villages um, who are neglected or they are victims of stigma, as I will explain, and they are left on their own. So um, administrators of the school would go to the villages and with permission of the parents, bring them to this school. Albinos, obviously, uh, many, there are so many superstitious beliefs around these children. So they find a beautiful haven in this institution, St. Mary's uh, School. Um, so then, just to highlight some of the hostile attitudes, uh, probably mostly arising from different cultures. So in a typical traditional setting, a child with a disability is born in this hostile envi environment that is marked by superstitious beliefs, cultural taboos, a lot of myths, all these leading to exclusion and isolation and even total uh, wiping away of any such children. Uh, whenever there is a disability in the home, there are accusations and counter accusations on who has brought this bad omen in our home. And uh, many people would end up uh, um, in the, uh, with the witch finders and there will be all the accusations who has bewitched uh, the child so that the child is born in that way. Um, so then marriages break and in the end, it's mostly the women who are the victims of injustice and they say the woman is responsible, she did something, that's why the child is born in this way. It is not uncommon to hear stories of uh, children being secretly killed at birth when they notice anything that seemed to them as uh, not normal or wrong. Or um, during the process of growing up, um, when there is something they consider to be abnormal, outside the norm, then they might even take the child out of the vill village and left for dead. They are so total abandonment because it is a bad spirit or a bad omen to the community. Those who would grow up 
um, who would uh, grow up, they grow up into exclusion, being excluded, hidden in their homes. Loved by their mom, loved by their siblings, but they will not let the children be seen by the public because again of uh, victimization, uh, stigmatization, and, and so forth. And so they are deprived of socialization. A child, as a, in the village, a child would grow up learning how to survive. So from the adults, a child with a disability is denied this uh, possibility. Um, even to go to school, to the formal uh, education facility within the community. And even the sense of religious affiliation. Children find joy in going with their parents to church and playing with other children. But a child with a disability is locked and remains at home. And so is deprived or denied of uh, this possibility as well. So then, uh, such children would grow into isolated, homeless adults who are often reduced to begging on the streets or other places because they never had learned anything or ways of surviving. Others would use their disability as a way to uh, get some sympathy and uh, win assistance. Others would use even unorthodox methods. No, uh, just to be out there and survive. Others still would resort to violent behaviors, especially provoked by the attitude of the public. Other children would be laughing at them or making fun of them. Then they'll pick stones and start throwing or insulting or doing anything that is uh, antisocial, but it is all provoked by uh, the attitude of uh, the public or the community. These are just some highlights of uh, a hostile environment in which somebody with a disability in a typical traditional setting would grow up. But uh, the perspectives obviously has been changing, especially with the arrival of the missionaries at the end of the 19th century, um, and then the post-independence uh, uh, Zambia where there was creation and spread of special schools, they would call them, for the general education and skills training of children with disabilities. Uh, it is in this light that uh, my diocese, among others, is uh, running uh, two such institutions. What I mentioned earlier, St. Mary's School for the Visually Impaired Children, as well as albinos and another school for children with uh, intellectual disabilities. Usually the religious sisters are helping me uh, to run these institutions, plus a number of trained lay uh, men and women. Um, such institutions do provide um, the desired friendly environment for the child to experience love acceptance and freedom. They also enhance the necessary self-acceptance as well as the necessary confidence, self-confidence, which prepare the child to venture into the, uh, into the public arena. So uh, further education to become uh, self-advocates and participate in the life of the community in general. Uh, 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 people with disabilities, children with disabilities who have been to such institutions or uh, schools have really gained in self-confidence and they can stand up to anyone and fight for their rights and uh, uh, justice. Um, so then we can also see that um, The parents are at a loss in a village. They don't know what to do, how to take care of this uh, child. And so when they're able to send a child in an institution or in, um, uh, in the special school, it gives a certain relief 
that the child would have at least a future. The child would be granted uh, the possibility to get formal education and be able to be independent in future. Thanks to such institutions, today there is a good number of well-educated, okay, not, not very many, but at least some well-educated and successful people who are also advocates for greater inclusion. These are the source of hope for the future of our country as well as the region uh, of Mansa Diocese. Um, what motivates uh, the actions on the part of our diocese is always the Imago Dei image of God. God who created uh, human beings in God's image as we read in the book of Genesis. Um, this is obviously the biblical uh, foundation from where we all derive our dignity, the dignity that is proper to every person, whoever they be, whatever their condition may be. And also, we draw our theological motivation and action from the Great Commission and command of Jesus to go therefore and make disciples and baptize everyone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Again, it is all nations, all peoples, all creatures, depending which translation or, uh, or text we are using. And that, uh, from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians and to the Ephesians, we are members of this mystical body of Christ. Our human language cannot fully describe or comprehend the mystical body of Christ, but every person is an essential component of the mystical body of our Lord Jesus Christ without excluding anyone. And persons with disabilities are equally called to participate in the great mission, the great command. They are equally called to be ministers, to announce Christ to others, just as they also should be beneficiaries who should receive the gospel of the Lord, hence the need for inclusion to be part of the congregation of the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are just highlights of biblical references that motivate our action towards people with disabilities. Um, in terms of pastoral action, um, to counter the cultural challenges highlighted in this presentation, um, uh, since I took um, pastoral care of this diocese five years ago, we have undertaken initiatives and deliberate pastoral actions to promote better understanding of the dignity of every human person created in the image and likeness of God. So then we have uh, conducted workshops in which we have invited priests and parents and relatives and uh, people with uh, disabilities to raise awareness, to raise awareness. And then there have been concrete shared experiences of families. Um, over the years, um, I've uh, come to know my dear friend Billy Bedor, uh, the brother to our dear friend here, Sandy Bedor, who is present with us. Sandy, oh, she's over there. She's uh, been my friend. I've known her for over 10 years. Uh, what a bill indicated at the beginning. Uh, a training program was set, um, um, organized also by Sandy, to come over to the United States. And with Amy Hewitt, uh, we did some programs uh, in Minnesota. That really gave me the motivation and was the first time I met uh, uh, Billy, who is now 54 years old and is Down syndrome, but a very lovely, lovely guy who has inspired me. And thanks to God, the parents of Sandy graciously accepted my invitation for Billy to come over to Zambia and to Mansa and to conduct some training programs we are talking about is uh, not very verbal, 
but his presence is really, uh, uh, is really a presence that touches lives. So together with Sandy and Amy and other experts, they did come to Zambia, and that really has given an, uh, 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 a certain force to have us continue with this uh, program. So that's part of our training activities, the workshops we held together, and at the end, Amy, the right, uh, uh, the other picture, Amy handing out some certificates of all to all the participants with Billy. They are giving uh, also the assistance. Pastoral action and fruit. Um, there is also uh, steady growth in the community interaction and participate in advocacy programs. Every third, third of December, there is the day for people with uh, disabilities. And in our local context, uh, there are people with disabilities coming together and marching the streets and having speeches and uh, uh, advocacy and so forth. More and more people from our community, from the parish communities, are participating, including their bishop over there, together with other people marching and creating awareness, especially to include everyone. The fruits of uh, such programs our small Christian communities within the parish, parish are reaching out to the families, especially where children are hidden and not let out to participate in the life of the community. I've seen small Christian communities reaching out. And as I indicate in the third um, uh, bullet there, uh, it was from the small Christian community as they prepared people for the sacrament of confirmation that one community, three young people who are uh, deaf uh, were part of those who were confirmed just two months ago, which never happened. And as I preached and conducted the service, there was somebody who was signing to them. And so they were fully part of this congregation. And this really opened the eyes of other communities that, oh, I can also bring my child, I can also come and register to receive the sacraments. And also, the ministry of readers. At one celebration, um, we invited one person who uh, is blind to proclaim the word of God, something that the people in my parish and diocese had never seen before. He comes, he had prepared his text, and he proclaimed the word of God is coming from this text, and he read by the end of the reading, as people, he said this, the word of God, and people, instead of responding, thanks be to God, all rose up and were applauding somewhere in tears because they never expected that a blind person could stand up and proclaim the word of God. And so we are having a number of... Uh, people with different abilities coming forth to see what they can do in terms of participating in the life of our, our local community. So in conclusion, it is felt that the Mansa Diocese is steadily making a difference in countering hostile cultural beliefs and attitudes towards people with disabilities through its vision of embracing everyone with the love of Christ and the pastoral approach that is motivated by Christ, the Good Shepherd. Families and local communities are becoming more open to interacting with people with disabilities. And it is hoped that this would gradually enhance the inclusion in education worship, job opportunities, and many other uh, possibilities. Indeed, for us, disability is not in ability. Thank you. This afternoon, there's going to be a workshop time with 
uh, both uh, Christopher and Bishop Chichanga uh, for people to continue the conversation with them. But we do have a couple of minutes where there could be a couple of questions. Uh, uh, anybody have any questions? And why don't both of you come up here in case you, there's a question so you can respond. And could somebody back there, if you've got a couple of extra mics, uh, microphones, do we have any questions of either? Meg. Um, you told us about some of the hard things in your countries, and I'm wondering about some of the good things. Um, for example, I would imagine that there's, folks are more likely to care for aging parents in their homes in your communities, perhaps, and so, uh, as opposed to nursing homes and, and whatnot. And so I would imagine that there's practices around caring for elders that can be translated into caring for folks with disabilities in the home, and where are some strengths that we can learn from you about that care within the community? Thank you. Uh, thank you, it's true. Um, we have those uh, stories of uh, men and women, mothers and fathers who are heroes who have defied some demands of uh, the cultures, and they held on tight and with love to their kids with whatever disability. And those are really heroes and uh, people to whom we refer uh, and uh, who are sources of hope for many other people. They may not have resources on, or even the knowledge of what to do, but all they give is their love and their presence. Our role as church is now to find another step. So how do we give the necessary support to such parents? Yes, it is true. We have those uh, uh, values or heroes and heroines to look up to. Thank you. Uh, thanks for popping up this question. Uh, the Indian Ecumenical Disability Accompaniment is a facilitating body. Uh, we directly don't involve in implementation part. But the churches do have old age homes and uh, with, the, with the modern approaches they take up these ministries as they have involved with the uh, people with disabilities program also. I think one of the things that Meg was getting at is, and I've lived in Nigeria, um, and part of this is that in the part of Nigeria where I lived in, if some, I used to be always the one saying this, but now I'd be the one receiving it, that if someone, if I came up to someone who was older than I was, I would have to say migwa, which would mean I, rec I recognize that you are older than I am and I respect you for that wisdom and age. And uh, there was a response to that, but as a younger person, you were, that was part of the salutation. And you know, I think what we've, my experience and what we've heard is that there's this, a greater sense of respect, I think, for people who are elderly in some of your countries than here. Uh, and uh, that there's so many people uh, who past retirement or as they get more fragile, uh, begin to feel very much isolated as well um, in, 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 our in our communities in this country. Yeah. I'm just curious, in the last five years since you've instituted more acceptance of people with disabilities in your diocese, have you found a ripple effect? Have other churches in your community shown an interest, come on board, has your diocese expected, expressed an interest in, in communicating that to other churches outside of your diocese? Uh, thank you, um, a good question. Um, when we started these programs, actually they have not been limited to Catholics. Uh, when we did the training programs, 
the first program where Amy, Sandy, Colleen, and Billy came. It was open to everyone, and uh, the team was a uh, ecumenical team. So the ripple effect is there. I see now collaboration with other um, uh, denominations that they are also making effort to reach out and include uh, people with disabilities in their mission and uh, programs. And then beyond Mansa Diocese, in our conference of bishops, it is something, uh, because it's a passion for me, it's something I've sh I'm sharing with other bishops on how we can bring it on a national level and do more than we are doing to have deliberate pastoral programs that would enable uh, our communities to reach out to people with disabilities and uh, uh, include them. Then beyond that, in the revised, or uh, the Ratio Fundamentalis, the revised program of training of priests on the um, universal level of the Roman Catholic Church, which has been brought to the national levels, there is always inclusion that we find a way of including the training, preparing of future priests on reaching out and caring for people with disabilities. So we really hope for that. This will uh, bring the desired results. The World Council of Churches has a group called the Ecumenical Disability Advocacy Network, if you don't know about it, and its base is in Nairobi, in Kenya. And one of the, they have regional affiliates around the world, and the ones in both West Africa and East Africa have held consultations and conferences for theology professors in seminaries and others, and again, a couple of publications have come out of those. Uh, in our early institute, one of our early ones, Sam Kabui, uh, was was present for one of the workshop, one of the institutes, as well as uh, Angeline Okola. Thank you, sir, uh, uh, who's now taken over from him. But if it's it's an interesting group, how many of you, in your relationship to your faith communities, know if your faith communities or networks have contacts with? congregations or mission groups in Africa? How about India? So I hope some of you will come and have a chance to meet uh, with them. I have an invitation to some of you. We have, a few years ago, I met a woman named Mama Josephine Bakita, who's from Tanzania who runs a small organization. She had a child with multiple disabilities who's now deceased, but she helped start one orphanage and now she's got a small organization where she essentially goes out into the bush, as we call it in Africa, uh, to bush uh, to find kids with disabilities who don't get any supports and bring some in for school and try to help provide some basic schooling. Mama Vakita is really looking for a couple of congregations to partner with in the United States, uh, both in terms of some basic funding and opportunities for groups to come there and help them build some basic uh, residents to be part of their mission. So if you'd like to, I, I have not, I met her personally in Cape Town about 11 years ago at an international conference and she's been quietly pursuing me ever since uh, <laughs> and, and, and with great uh, gentleness and determination. And the people who have met her since and seen her work have, have said, Bill, she's sort of like a Mother Teresa in, in that part of Tanzania. So if you have an interest, I'd love to connect you with her. Uh, I'd love to, and I'm hoping sometime to get to go over to, to, uh, to just meet her and see more of the work that they're doing. Let me just say one final word about context in terms of yesterday as well. Uh, it, our context so determines how we see and what we see. Uh, and as Carmen said yesterday also, what we miss. Uh, but I grew up in a country in the part of Nigeria where it was still in the 50s, 50s when I was there. And so a white person was still relatively uncommon, even with the British uh, uh, as a colony. So when we would go out from the hospital compound where my dad was a doctor and go out into village churches, on Sunday morning there would be a crowd of kids gathering very quickly, 
saying, Oyibo, Oyibo, Oyibo. Stephen knows where I'm going with this. <laughs> and you think about, so how do we, if you haven't seen a person who is white, or what we call white, how do you think about how in your language would you understand that difference? And we need, we, and when we talk about intellectually disabled, well, that's, we're thinking, well, intellect is really the most important thing, and how do we understand that? You know, we, how do we understand that? Well, what that word meant was, literally, that I was a peeled one. <laughs> that the only way that I could understand a white person was that as a black person who'd been peeled, and underneath was this pink flesh that, wherein we were all alike together. So it's a fairly painful disability, and I never had that experience. <laughs> but but it, it's also just a remarkable thing to me to think about how we all, from de who we are in the context in which we live determines what we see. Uh, so this morning you have an opportunity to hear from a Nigerian. Uh, Stephen, you're going to have to, I, I, Shulipo, yes, yep, who, who uh, graced us last night arriving about one o'clock and I was, took him to his room and didn't know there was another person in his room who was quite startled by the fact that we were there. <laughs> and that person happened to be Muno, uh, uh, who I didn't know, I didn't know last night. I just, we just backed out quickly and I said, sorry. And so Stephen stayed in my room. Uh, but they too are doing a workshop this morning, speaking respectably from the work in Nigeria and thinking about that, and also Muno from Zimbabwe. Muno and his a colleague, Doreen, were here last year and just loved being here and have started projects and ministry since then. So I hope you'll go and have a chance to talk with them. And uh, then this afternoon, both Patrick and, and uh, Christopher will have a workshop time where you can talk more with them. and. Especially, I hope some of you who have congregations or doing work in those countries will make connection with them. Um, <clears throat> the afternoon workshop will be more on a specific programs that could challenge the disability discourse. Uh, if you are interested to join and accompany the ministries which we are undertaking, please join. And at the outset, we both, we would like to express our gratitude to Billy, and also congratulating 10 years of this institute. As a token of our love and gratitude, I request Bishop to kindly present this memento to Bill. Uh, this talks about towards just and inclusive communities. Yeah. And also I wish to present this book. This is an outcome of the Disability Institute, what we had. Lots of faith stories. Uh, Bible studies challenging. Only five are remaining. If you wish, you could pick up that. Thank you. So we, uh, we add to this, uh, in my diocese, it's mostly fish, but I could not import fish from there to be dangerous. <laughs> So I mentioned Zambia is one of the big uh, producers of copper. I have copper bracelets, which I would like to leave with Bill and the organizing team to thank you. Okay. And as a souvenir. <laughs> that is, uh, organizing team, there's an auction of the bracelets. Just a minute. Here's a <laughs> Help me again thank the both of them for a wonderful session. <laughs>